The Leadership Quest Literature Review is not your standard literature review. You must be aware of that. It has a particular purpose. It's looking for answers rather than looking at critiques, right? So just to be aware of that. Not to say that critique can't come into it, but it's basically about looking for answers. I'm going to recap very quickly on what we covered last year at the beginning of the year and then move on and talk about the leadership quest. You should have had two documents uploaded today. One was a revised version of the brief. So you should have got that on your website on Sakai. And also the slides that I'm using, we uploaded just before the start of the session. Just to speak very quickly about the change in the brief, we were asked to reduce the requirements for the leadership quest because they wanted you to be able to have more time to focus on your ARPs. Therefore, you've got the original brief that was given to you last year, 2018, on your website, and you have the new brief for 2019, which has certain sections taken out and reduces the requirement by a margin. Not a huge margin, but by a margin. As I said in my uh, posting on the Sakai site, you're welcome to use either. If you want to use the old one, you're welcome to do it. Uh, if you want to use the new one, you're welcome to do it. If you choose to use the 218 version, you must let your marker know when you submit. Right? Simple as that. Um, you'd be strange to want to do the 218 one, okay? <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, what it leaves out is it leaves out the requirement to do the time shift exercise and it leaves out some other requirements. As I say, if you're down the track and you've done it and you want to carry on, you're welcome to do it, but there's really no reason to do the slightly more demanding one uh, than now that you've got the 219 one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take down the 218 one, more than likely about 10 days, just so people don't become confused. I'll put a notice saying I've taken it down, but at least allow you time to have a look and see, and if there's any reason that you want to do the other one, you're welcome to do it. There's a change in the mark structure, which I'll speak about, which may concern you. If it does concern you, then do the old one, but it's really a minor change. So as you know, what we're going to do is we're going to post a raw version of exactly what I'm going to say this evening and upload that, and then we'll upload it to YouTube, and then we'll do an edited version and take down the raw version when we get there. So what are we going to be covering this evening? We're going to be talking about what is leadership, because that's the start of the leadership quest. We're going to ask you to come up with some themes while you're in the class here. We're going to talk a little bit about personal change and the models of personal change. We're going to speak a little bit now, because you tell me you've gone through literature reviews, so I won't spend time on that. But what is a good literature review? We talk about the personal action plan section of your assignment. And then finally, talk about the leader's manifesto, some questions, and then close. That's our agenda for this evening. The first thing is just to talk about why we ask you to do the leadership quest. It's the only module on the MBA that deals with leadership. So it's very important to you that you actually master leadership and what is leadership. And this has been done through independent study. But it's really to allow you to work out what you want to be as a leader and then to make plans to become that great leader. So as to help you to become the leader you want to become, we fully recognize that there may be people who say, I do not want to be a leader, okay? Which is quite legitimate. You don't have to be a leader to be successful. You don't have to be a leader to be happy. But what we are saying is, unfortunately, as a requirement of the MBA, you still have to do the leadership quest, and then you have to imagine yourself as a leader. So I'm afraid one can't escape it because you say, I don't want to be a leader. It would be the same as saying, I don't want to have anything to do with finance, right? We ask you still to do finance. I'm afraid that's the MBA. Just to recap then, two things that go into it. One is looking at the literature to find out what is said about great leadership. And number two, once I know what I want to be as far as a leader, then I have to ask myself, how do I change? Two elements to it. One leadership, the other is... How do I change? So that's what you'll be doing in terms of Leadership Quest. Just to reiterate once again, it's part of independent study, two components to independent study. 
the one being the ARP, the other being the Leadership Quest. Both of them at a very high academic level, NQF level 9. PhD, of course, is NQF level 10. So it's at a very high level. We've reduced the requirement. We're now saying about 200 hours, where we were saying 300 hours. We brought it down in that way. And as I've said, there are two components to the Leadership Quest. One is a written document, and the other is the three-minute manifesto, leader's manifesto video. So fairly straightforward and simple. This is the one that causes people headaches, but just to run through it, that's the breakdown of what you're required to do. You've got your literature review, which is basically 6,000 words, 20 pages. We're working on words, not pages. Literature review on models of personal change, about 3,000 words, basically 10 pages. My personal action plan, also about 10 pages, 3,000 words. And then insights from the MBA are 3,000 words, about 10 pages, right? And then your video is three minutes. Now, the question we get asked is this. If I write less than the required amount, will I be penalized? Good question. Do you like that question? Yes. And what is puzzling is why would you want to write less? Okay. Well, in all honesty, why would you want to write less? And there's only one answer, is it takes less work. So what we're saying is you will not get penalized for writing fewer words. You will be penalized because more than likely the content won't be there. But it's not a matter of penalizing because you're below the word count. You do get penalized if you go above the word count. So it's basically 30 pages. I think the requirements come down by about five pages on that. But you'll do the two. Now, just to be quite clear, we're not saying that you've got to write exactly to those parameters. We're just saying that's what we'd expect a reasonable literature review to be, and then the other sections as well. So if you take something like the insights from the MBA, there if you've got great insights and you've covered what you need to cover and you're below 10 pages, that's fine. So it's not about writing the correct number of words. It's about giving the information that is asked for. Happy with that? That is basically the structure of the leadership quest. Straightforward and simple in my mind. Very, very easy to follow. Then we have an interim submission, which you knew about from last year. Interim submission is only the literature review. Only the literature review. And that is made up, of course, of two components the leadership and the personal change. So you've got those two there. You're going to get written feedback from your marker. You'll be allocated to a marker and you'll be told who your marker is. It'll be posted on the website and you can see who your marker is. And the markers will then communicate with you after you submit your interim submission. It counts for 10% of the mark of the literature review. And here comes the change that I spoke about. It counts for 10% of the literature review. The literature review counts for 50% of the entire written project. Therefore, it accounts for 5% overall, the interim submission. Happy about that? So it's actually a very low percentage that the interim submission counts. Under the 2018 model, there were no marks for the literature review. Okay? So to be fair, there is no jeopardy if you did a really bad job at the interim submission, there is no penalty. Now there would be a penalty, right? What would the penalty be? More than likely one or two percentage points, right? If you work, do the calculation. But that you must be aware of. So if you opt to do the new one, it will be under the new system where you get a mark for the submission. Whereas before you could submit, and as long as you submit it, there was no penalty. So just to be aware of that change, it's, in my mind, a very minor change. If you think about it, if you do an excellent job, you're more than likely going to get four out of five. If you do a mediocre job, you're going to get something like two and a half out of five. If you do a really bad job, you're more than likely to get two out of five. So you can see it's not really a huge issue. But still, you need to be aware of that. As you know, the final submission that you make, the final one, not the interim submission, you must then send your track changes directly to your marker so that they can see whether you've responded to the feedback that you were given. Now, the reason we ask you to send it directly to the markers is that Sakai cannot cope with track changes. So if you submit a document, upload a document to Sakai with track changes, it cannot do the similarity index. So therefore, we ask you to upload a clean copy 
to Sakai and send the track changes copy separately to your marker. But that is all in the brief that you have. They only look at the literature review. Okay? They do not look at the other because it's meant to be just the literature review. The reason for that, if you think about it, this project, your biggest problem is going to be the literature review. The rest should be fairly straightforward. Should be. If you think about it, once you know what you want to be, you know what you do to change, then you're just working out a plan of action. And that you shouldn't need too much feedback on. Happy about that? Okay. So a literature review, it's a very specific form. It is not the same as the ARP. So please do not say to the people, your supervisors, we were told when we were doing the leadership quest that this is what you need to do for a literature review. What you've been told to do for a literature review for the ARP, that is what you do for the ARP. What I'm going to speak to you about now is what you need to do for the literature review for the leadership quest. What we are saying with the leadership quest is this. We want you to discover what you should do to become a great leader from the literature. We are prepared to entertain YouTube videos as being part of that search. We even prepare to entertain the fact that you speak to somebody and ask them, what is your key to being a great leader? Do you see the difference? We say, go out and find answers. It, there are a lot of it will come from the regular literature, but equally you can go to YouTube, you can ask other people. Still have to reference it, by the way, but you can ask other people. But yeah, you must reference it, which is just personal communication in the deck, right? But you'll see how to do it. But what we're saying is, what we're really concerned is, have you worked out what you need to do to be a great leader? We're not so interested in the critical review of leadership literature, more a matter of finding answers. So you're not going to have a debate backwards and forwards about some minor point in the literature. So your literature review must be written in the third person, as it would be for the ARP. The literature review is written in the third person. This is not about what I think I should do to be a great leader. Happy about that? Because at this stage, you're looking in the literature to see what is said about what you need to do to be a great leader. And therefore, you're reporting on the literature at this stage, not yourself. We do say this, that you're looking at the literature through your own lens. Would anyone like to venture why we say look at the literature through your own lens? In other words, you go and find what you think is important. Why do we say that? Anyone like to give a view? Right. The reason we're saying that is if you've got two people sitting next door to each other, they would have different things that they want to find out to be great leaders. Happy about that? One person says, I need to work out what I need to do in terms of problem solving. The other one says, I need to work out what to do in terms of communication. And they're quite entitled to go and look for those answers and say, this is what I'm going to do. And they will not be the same. Because they're saying, if I think about myself, this is what I need to find out. Happy about that sort of approach. So it's really about you, your lens, looking at the literature, finding answers for yourself. So, OK, notice that it's about what a leader must be and do. So B would be about characteristics of a person. So they must be trustworthy. A do must be, I must stick to my word. That would be do, which are tied with trust. OK, so and then, of course, you're going to look at what you need to do to systematically change. You're going to look for five themes in leadership, five themes in leadership that you think would benefit you. Rest assured that there are many more themes, both in leadership and that you would like to look at. We're saying take five good themes and look at these and get the literature on those. I'm going to ask you just now to come up with some themes. And then you must make reference to the prescribed readings, which have remained the same. So if you want to do the 218, it will remain the same, uh, or virtually the same. But you must make reference to the prescribed readings. There are four of them at the back of the course pack. At the conclusion of your literature review, you must have two summaries, one which relates to leadership and the other that relates to personal change. So it is there. You'll see it in the course pack. But please, just a summary. What did I find out about leadership? Short summary. What did I find out about personal change? Just pulling it all together. And then the word of caution, which I would have mentioned last year, is that it's easier to write a chronological account of the change in leadership thought than it is to look for answers in the literature. 
Therefore, when people run out of time, they give us a chronological development of the field of leadership, which I'm afraid we then reject out of hand because it's not looking for answers. So if you go to any textbook on leadership, you'll see they'll tell you about how the field developed. And that's what people then do. They give us the field and how it developed. So just read the word of caution. It is there, but don't fall into the trap of going the easy route and saying, right, that's great. Now I'll just talk about how leadership theory developed. That's not looking for answers. OK, so now we're going to talk about leadership in general. And the first thing you'll notice that there is no single view of what great leadership is. You'll not go to any literature and will say, this is a definitive answer. These are all the studies that support this approach. Unfortunately not. So certainly if we look at Bill George, he talks about over a thousand studies, and they did not find single characteristics that led people to being great leaders. If you're going to be a great leader, you're going to be a great leader in your own image. You will have worked for very good leaders, who will have been very different. Do they have flaws? Yes, indeed, they do have flaws. So it's a matter of saying, what do I need to do to improve my leadership, not to become perfect? OK, so authentic leadership is a very good route to go. And you could certainly have a theme that you want to develop on authentic leadership. It's a very good theme to have, because there's a lot written about it. And Bill George, who writes on authentic leadership, tackles it directly. He also says this is what you need to do to become an authentic leader. So being authentic, knowing yourself, and being yourself is a very good route to great leadership, just to be aware of it. Then, if you do know yourself, you have to acknowledge that you could be the problem. Of all the articles that I've read on leadership, only once have I ever come across one of the leaders saying, I was the problem. Most leaders will have all sorts of views about what needs to be done and strategy, yak and blah. But this particular leader, Ralph Steyer, he said, I realized I was the problem. He then goes on to say this, and these are the words he uses. He says, thank God I was the problem. He says, if I'm the problem, I change myself and I fix it. Now, what is interesting about the statement that he made, he was trying to do his very best. He was trying to empower people. And what he realized is, that for all he spoke a good game about empowerment and wanting to empower people, very genuinely, it wasn't just saying the words, but he did the wrong things. And he disempowered people rather than empowered them. But if he hadn't realized that he was the problem, he'd just say you can't empower people. They just don't want to do it. But he said, no, I'm the problem. He changed what he did, and then he truly empowered the people. But that is self-insight to realize that maybe I am the problem, and maybe I need to change, not the other people. So just think about that. And then, of course, the other thing about leadership is leaders have to build long-term relationships. Think about the great leaders you've worked with. Typically, you would have liked to have worked with them. Not always, but typically you would have. And you'd be happy to stay associated with them for a long period of time. So therefore, one of the things, one of the themes could well be, how do I build and maintain long-term relationships? Because I've got to ask myself that question. If I'm not trustworthy, am I likely to maintain relationships? And the answer comes back more than likely, no. So that in itself would be a discipline if I want to build and maintain long-term relationships. So there's the definition of leadership. It's a very simple definition of leadership. It covers most of the main points. You understand it and you warm to it. That lead is there to influence people towards achieving goals in your organizations whether they be private or public sector, the same thing applies, right? So what leaders are there to do is to make sure things happen and to make sure that the right things happen so that we can achieve the objectives that have been set. Notice, though, if you look at the bottom, there are th three things that are required. You need willing, capable, and able followers. So as a leader, I've got to ask myself this question. Am I working towards making people willing, capable, and am I enabling them? empowering and giving them everything I want. So as a leader, if I'm looking at my leadership quest, I should be asking those questions. When I'm finished with my leadership quest, will I have willing, capable, and enabled followers? Because as a leader, it's not about you doing it. It's about, in fact, the others doing the work and getting things done. The next definition 
is a definition that some people like and some people don't like. It's not perfect. It has flaws in it. The flaws that you'd like to point out are this. Who knows what's worthwhile? Who knows what is a greater good? But if you can live with the fact that we might not be able to define those clearly, do you say this is a good definition of leadership or not? Anyone like to venture a view whether it's a good definition of leadership or not? There's something missing from it, but I'll talk about that just now. But besides that, do you like it or not? So I say you can argue about the greater good. You can all argue about worthwhile as well. What is actually missing, it doesn't say where we're going. Notice that? It doesn't say where we're going, which it should do, because it should be towards some sort of objectives. This is a bit airy-fairy. Now, if I may, I'm going to tell you what I like about it, and then you're welcome, of course, to critique it in that way. But what it does say is you want to treat people with care, respect, and fairness. And why are we doing that as a leader? We're doing it to unleash their potential so that they can contribute more. So that is a good part about it. But certainly it's not perfect. It's flawed in many ways. As, by the way, the other one is a bit simple, simplistic in terms of what it says. You need to come to grips with what is leadership because if you want to write a leadership quest, you have to be clear about what leadership really is. And then what am I here to do if I'm a leader? Then we have the difference between management and leaders. Uh, this is only just to alert you to the fact that you are writing a leadership quest, not a management quest. So therefore, stick to the elements of leadership. If you look at the slide on the screen, you'll see that they paint a pretty gloomy picture of managers and a much more inspiring one in terms of leaders. Now, some people say this, leaders manage and managers lead, and there undoubtedly is a crossover between the two functions. But there's certain things that leaders do that managers typically don't do. Sometimes they do a little bit of it, the managers, but the leaders do a lot more of it. So the first one we take is setting direction. So if you were the head of EdCon, would you know what direction to set? Okay. As we know, EdCon, 140,000 jobs indirectly. So leadership, if you're looking at commercial leadership, it's about trying to win in the marketplace, which is exactly what EdCon has to do. And things have changed, and it's more difficult than it used to be. So certainly that would be part of it. Then we have creating new systems and structures, very important. So leaders will design organizations, and they will then make sure that the organization works, and of course they'll create new systems as well. So if you look at uh, something like Discovery Health, the structure and the systems are very important to it being effective, to be aware of that. And those come typically from leadership. How many of you have the Discovery or the Vitality, no, Discovery app on your phones? Must be quite a few of you have it on it. Right, good. And think about that. That is integral to the whole product offering, and that is designed indirectly by the leader. Leaders must have a view of the future. What is the price of petrol going to be in the year 2020? We don't know, right? But we have to take some sort of view if we're a leader. And then leader is a social architect. This is a fairly major impact that leaders have, and that has to do with the design of buildings and equally the structure of meetings and other elements in an organization. So leaders have to design how people meet and speak. In this room, we should have quite a few people from Standard Bank. Is that correct? Yes, we have people from Standard Bank. So the new building in Rosebank, was that designed to foster collaboration communication? The answer is yes, so I won't wait for anyone else to answer. The answer is yes. Uh, I spent a great deal of money on it, and certainly when we visited the building, I think, did you visit the building as well? Did you visit Standard Bank's building in Rosebank? No, okay. But certainly we visited uh, the previous years, and the people would say what is wonderful is I want to speak to somebody for marketing. I literally walk down the passage and I speak to them. I don't have to drive to another building or anything else like that. So it fosters collaboration that way. So leaders, as social architects, they design the circumstances where people will meet and speak. And very often it has to do with physical design of buildings. We have a case study written on that, by the way, if you're interested. So, and then aligning people, inspiring, vision, mainly generalists, and of course leaders bring about change. Now the very serious question is, why do leaders bring about change? Why is it that so often you bring a new leader in, 
and all of a sudden they start restructuring and doing all sorts of things. And therefore you need to ask yourself the question, if I'm going to be a great leader, should I be bringing about change? Why do leaders bring about change? We had a structure, guess what? It landed us in the soup, right? Now we have to change things and make it work better. I've got a view of what we need to do in the marketplace. Now I want to structure the organization so it can, can deliver what we're trying to achieve. Structure follows strategy. You will have learned that in strategy. But leaders come in very often, they say, right, it's not working the way it was, therefore we need to change it. And part of the change would be redesigning the organization. Very often that does include downsizing, I'm afraid, but certainly they're saying, for this thing to work, we need to have a new structure, and I'm going to bring in that new structure. So leaders bring about change because they want to achieve objectives, and they recognize that it can only be done if they change the structure of the organization. What the managers do on the other side is they bring order to complexity. So they make things happen within the structure that the leader set. So leadership with a capital L. Uh, Peter Bacon, when he was the head of Sun International, he used to sit down every evening and he'd have an executive pad and he'd ask himself this question. What must I do tomorrow to lead this organization? And then he'd write down what he needs to do to lead the organization. Why is that a very strong question for a CEO to ask him or herself every evening? Why would you want to do that? Think about that, your leadership quest. What would it speak to? So every evening I ask myself the question, what do I need to do to lead this organization tomorrow? Notice I'm not asking the question, what must I do tomorrow? I'll give the answer for you, if you'll empower me to do that. So think about this. What, what Peter Bacon saying to himself is, you know what? I've only got so much time and attention as the CEO. And I must spend that on really important issues to lead the organization. I cannot go in and deal with trivial matters because then I'm wasting my time. I must keep my eye focused on the horizon, where we're going to, and I must make sure that we get there. I must pay attention to the really important issues and not pay attention to the minor issues. So if you were to take over as the head of Eskom, right, hopefully your first task would not be to redesign the logo. <laughs> do you see that? So we want a new image, so what we're going to do, and this happens by the way, first thing we're going to do is we're going to put people in uniforms, so they look snazzy when the people come to Megawatt Park, and we're going to put them in uniforms, and we're going to redesign the logo, so people see a visible change in our organization. Don't worry about the 420 billion, we'll get to that, but let's just make sure that people can see that things have changed. Okay? Big one? Yeah. <laughs> but can you see, the leader must go in and deal with the really big issues. If you're the head of Eskom, hopefully every night you sit down and you say, what are we going to do about the 420 and counting billion? Because we don't get that sorted out, it doesn't help to have anything else sorted out. Okay, so just that. And then of course, from that as I've mentioned, and something to think about in terms of your themes for leadership, one should be on personal productivity. What am I going to do to make sure that I'm more productive as a leader? And of course, productive means I'm doing leadership things, because that's what I'm here to do. Not just working harder and longer, but actually delivering on my mandate as a leader. So the use of time, very, very important for a leader, and that certainly could be a theme that you want to progress, which is personal productivity, personal mastery, or self-leadership, something of that nature. Then, of course, we know that to be a great leader, you need to cover three areas, just to recap on them. You've got the head part of it, where you've got the thinking, your thinking, and other people's thinking in the organization, about setting a direction. You're going to ask these sorts of questions. Who are our customers of the future? Think about that. What products and services will they demand? What trends and technologies should we be watching? and who are we going to get to run this organization in the future. So that would be in terms of thinking about strategy and what we need to do, the head part of it. Then we have the heart part of it, which is basically the emotions. So emotional intelligence certainly could fall under this area. How are we going to win people's hearts to get their minds? 
bearing in mind it's the 13th of February today, right? Treating people well and with dignity and respect, right? Listening to them, very important stuff. Building relationships and networks. Do you think that's important for a leader? Just to have those networks that they can work with. Hence, lots of leaders will go overseas and do courses at business schools overseas. Part of what they're doing is to build an international network. That's why they're doing it. Okay? And then, of course, knowing and interacting with your people, just staying on top of things. And that would be management by wandering around. Very, very worthwhile. Management by wandering around. Uh, came from Hewlett Packard. You can see the short videos on the internet if you want to watch that. But certainly, one of the best ways of being a visible leader is to practice management by wandering around. Notice you cannot practice management by wandering around unless you free yourself up and have time. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting behind your desk or sitting in meetings all the time. So management by wandering around, I uh, might have mentioned to you last year, but Gail Kelly, one of our alumni, uh, she was the head of one of the banks in Australia and was the highest paid female banker in Australia at the time. And when she worked in South Africa, she used to take a different route every day to her desk and speak to different people on the way to her desk. She was practicing management by wandering around in that sense. She also would phone two or three people around the country and speak to them, just to find out how things are going. Not to follow up on anything, but just to speak to them. So she certainly practiced management by wandering around very successfully. And then, of course, employee engagement. Question for leaders is, what am I doing to make sure that people are engaged? Have you ever been into an organization and you think that the people don't care? Have you ever had that? Right. Okay. If we had time, I'd let you go down to pick and pay, uh, but we don't. Okay. Very often, you get the impression that the people do not give a hoot about you, and they'd be very happy if you didn't ever come back again. Right? Now, that we speak about as being disengaged, employees being disengaged, and what we're looking for are employees who are engaged. You equally will have worked with organizations where people really care about what they're doing and they want to do their very best and they want to bring you back as customers. Those are engaged employees. So a leader has to create those circumstances. By the way, just as a matter of interest, we say that customer service is a surrogate measure for leadership. So when you deal with an organization and you get atrocious service, it actually goes all the way back to the leader. Because the leader is meant to put in place everything that is necessary for the company to service its customers. They must put it in place, right? So surrogate measure for leadership effectiveness would certainly be your customer service. OK, and as I say, we don't talk so much about employee motivation and all these other things. We speak more about employee engagement. And we say, first engage people, then direct them. So engagement is a precursor to performance management in that way. So as a leader, you should be saying, what can I do to engage people? And then from there, we can direct the efforts very well. Then, of course, the last element of this is what we talk as of the hands, getting things done, and any number of books written about getting things done. So you must be aware that if we get people on our side and we know where we're going, it doesn't help unless people actually do what's required. So therefore, the hands part of it, implementation, the battle cry of leaders, the main reason why executives fail, they just don't get things done. At the micro level, it's about performance management and managing people's expectations. At the macro level, it's about culture. If you remember the phrase, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. So therefore, the leader should be saying, how do I manage the culture so it's supportive of the strategy? The structure is very important, how we structure, and of course, our systems. And then a leader would be very wise to remember that behavior is a function of its consequences. People do things based on the consequences of their actions. Therefore, we talk about consequence management, and that would also be part of getting things done. We do have to be aware, however, that there are two sets of consequences. The one is external, such as pay, promotion, bonuses, 
corner office and the like, all external, and the other is internal. How the person feels about themselves when they perform or don't perform. So some people might work very hard because they have a high work ethic, and it's not about what anyone else says to them, or the bonus or the pay. They're doing it because they believe it's right to do it, and therefore it's driven by internal consequences. Other people are saying, if I work hard, I'll get a promotion, therefore I work hard. So it could either be internal or external, but behavior is a function of its consequences. And then, of course, measurement is a very important thing in making sure that things happen, and a wise leader would make sure that there are measures in place and then follow up on those measures. It's also very important from a leadership point of view where the measures are reported. So if we report measures at high levels at the right meetings, there's more than likely going to be action taken. If they're reported at lower levels, there's less likelihood of action being taken. So if you take a concrete example, we have one of our MBA students who's doing an investigation on IT governance. And one of the problems that she's discovered is that the senior meetings, there's no representation of IT. So therefore, when they meet and talk about where we're going and what we're doing, IT is not considered because they're not there. Whereas, if you're reporting measures at those meetings, there's a much better chance that something will actually happen and people pay attention to it. So measures very important, but equally where those measures are reported. Right, now we come to the leadership themes. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is to think about leadership themes. I've given examples in the course back of them, but leadership themes would be areas where if you think about it, where you improve your performance, this would lead to you being a better leader. I'll ask you for a few just now. So you're going to select two leadership themes and then write down five questions for each. Your question should be things that you would you'd want to know about what a leader must do and be to be effective in terms of that theme. So here's an example. Build and maintain long-term relationships. A very good starting off question would be, why is this important? So no matter what you've come up with, why is it important to leadership? So why is it important to leaders, for leaders to be in or have long-term relationships? Second one, what must a leader do to build relationships? How should leaders behave to be seen to be authentic in their relationships? And what would destroy a leader's relationships? Now those would be the questions that you'd go to the literature to seek answers. Okay? See how it works? Then, when you write the literature review, you wouldn't write answers to your questions, you'd consolidate it into paragraphs and just write about it. So now I'm going to ask you to just work with the people around you, twos and threes, come up with two or three themes, or two themes in this case, and then write down five <coughs> questions for each theme, and we'll take some feedback from everyone. But just remember this, always think about it. You've got to take what you discover, and you've got to feed it into an action plan. Yes. And you want to be careful that you're not always recommending a total personality change for yourself. Yes. Because that's not going to work. Whereas if I take something like communication, I could say, you know, I need to get out and speak to groups more. And the literature says you should do this, 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 and this. Yak, 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 yak. Then I say in my action plan, I'm going to do that, 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 and that. It all now nicely ties together. If I say I'm going to become more ethical, it's a bit of a problem. So what you've got to be very careful of is I do not select themes that make it very difficult for me to write up my action plan. So you should not select themes where it requires you to change as an individual. You should select those where you can actually go out and do things that will make a difference. So just take something like ethics. It's going to be a lot more difficult to write an action plan on what I need to do to be ethical than if I say I want to improve communication. Because there's some very definite things I can do to improve com communication. And these are things that I do. I don't change my character. Do you see that? And I would say to people that take one of your themes and do a little pilot test on it. So say, if this is what I'm saying, these are the sorts of things I'd write into my action plan. Follow it through in the logic. Because quite clearly, there must be a correspondence between what you went to the literature to go and look at and what you say you want to do. Because we're saying to you, you look for the literature that you want to study. And you want to study it because you're looking for answers for yourself. Therefore, if you find answers, then surely it should go into your action plan. But you see, if you took that, now it's, it says management by wandering around. You're looking at leadership. 
but you will have watched the videos and whatnot, which is back to the floor, where the CEOs go down to the floor, equally undercover bosses, so it's not confined to managers. It's a process that leaders engage in as well. But if you answered all those questions, you could then do that very well. If you changed how you operated based on that, you'd be a much better leader, quite clearly. Okay? Good. Okay, happy about the, how that worked? Very good example. Something that one can go out and do. You do not need to change your personality to go and do it. You can do it by just saying, these are the steps I'm going to follow. You'd be very wise to build in some sort of rough measurement to make sure that you are doing it and you're doing it consistently. So at the end of each week, I ask myself, how many times did I actually do Managed by Wandering Around? And if it's only once in that week, then things are not working there as should. If it's three times, it's more than likely going reasonably well. If it's five times, if it's appropriate, that's good. But equally, notice the one question that was asked there is, what must I be careful of? Because it's not always, always positive. It can be at the negative things that you can do, which destroys the system rather than builds up what you're trying to achieve. So it would be a very wise question to say, what must I be careful of as a leader? What does the literature say I should be careful of as a leader? So the literature says things like this. Be careful that your subordinates do not <coughs> think that you're following up on them the whole time and you're basically spying on them. Right? That you get from the literature and you know that you mustn't do it. Therefore, the way you do it is done in a particular way. There are also other cautions that come in which you'll pick up in the literature as well. But that would be a very good theme, a very successful theme. You can expand it. You can come with examples from companies where it was implemented and it worked very well. And for those of you who are counting words, very soon you've got three pages or four pages. Okay? That's for one style. <laughs> that's for one thing. Because that's not so much a leadership style. It's literally going to be called management by wandering around. And you're going to then talk about why it's effective for leaders. Because it's actually called management by wandering around. Okay? Good. Do you believe that communication is vital for leaders? So it's a very good theme. Do you agree? Because if I get that right, for the rest of my career, it's going to pay dividends. But it mustn't be a superficial view of communication. What I'm doing is going to literature to find out what I really need to do to be a great leader as a communicator. And then you're going to get that down. So when, when one reads it, they'll say, it's taken your understanding of communication by leaders three or four steps down the line. So the first question always, why is it important or is it important? Communication, answer comes back definitely. Reasons in the literature, you can support the idea why it's so important. Um, understanding the audience. Understanding the audience, yeah. Yep. Uh, the foresight. Yes, so just be careful. Being a visionary leader, leader is a different theme. It's a valid theme, but it's a different theme. Communication, if you have it as a theme, you could certainly look at how do I communicate the vision. But that is presuming that you've actually worked out what the vision is. So if you took visionary leadership as a theme, you'd have to say what do you need to do to get a good vision. When you're talking about communication, you presume that you've got a good vision, now you need to talk about how do I communicate it. Okay? I'm not sure about the foresight that you've got there, but... The other point we're talking about, um, what it takes me to listen more. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So certainly that you could look at as part of communication, right? Is the fact that you're going to listen more and talk less. Very important. That's still part of communication, right? Good. Then if you go into the literature on communication, you'll find a very, very important point that comes through. It says this that communication does not equal understanding. So therefore, when I find that in the literature, which you will find one of the prescribed readings, then I have to say to myself, how do I ensure understanding? Because that is the kernel of good communication. Not me just talk, 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 talk. It must be that there is some understanding. And you'd find that out. And if you then work on that for the rest of your career, you'll be far superior to other people who have a simple-minded view of communication.
managed by wandering around, I'd expect about five or six references. Yeah. Now, these things, they do not need to be peer-reviewed. Okay, because the problem is, there are more than likely very few studies that have been written about management by wandering around. There are more than likely very few peer-reviewed articles yeah. written about management by wandering around. But what you will find is you'll find 40 videos okay. on management by wandering around. You'll find 40 articles, Harvard Business Review, which is not peer-reviewed, by the way. You'll find it in Forbes magazine. You'll find it elsewhere. Good articles, credible people writing about this topic. That's why I'm saying be very careful. The leadership question, I must warn you, it's not the same as the ARP. This is looking for answers. And you can find very good answers in non-peer-reviewed articles from credible people. You'll have in total about 30 good references. Right? But just to remember, you could have videos that are part of that. You could have personal communication. And you could have equally say, non-peer-reviewed articles. But remember, they must be credible. It's not somebody's blog spot where they're writing from the top of their heads. Yeah, just to go back to why we're not insisting upon peer-reviewed is you'll find very little when you're looking for answers. There are very few uh, empirical studies on management development, very few. Equally, there are very few that will not just give you laundry lists of ideal leaders. So, but if you're looking at credible people, whether they've been the CEO of whatever, they'll give you our insights. And we, we hope that you're looking for good answers. And you are looking to see if people say, no, this doesn't work that way. That'd be good. You get somebody who's critical of a particular approach because that'll make you think and you look for other people who support the view. Happy with that? Because it, it's, I'm afraid when you're looking for answers, you're not going to go just to all the peer-reviewed articles. In, f in terms of the dates, by the way, there are certain what are referred to as seminal articles. <coughs> where there's an article written in 1984 where this particular author speaks about leadership and speaks about what leaders need to do. In my mind, what he had to say is still valid today. Things haven't changed, right? And he's a well-respected person who's still around, but he's a well-respected person. He wrote that some time back. But we don't want to see that all your articles are before 2000 and that you haven't looked at the latest literature. So by all means, you're quite entitled to use the sort of foundation articles that are there, but it should be also looking at what's happening. The world has changed. Mm -hmm. So you'll find nothing about agile leaders if you go back to 2000. It just won't be there. I'll join you on the page from the APA site. The APA site, the one reason why we use American Psychological Association referencing system <coughs> is that they have examples of every single thing you could have. So they'll have how do you reference a YouTube video yeah. there. In the old days, they had a manual about that thick. It wasn't only on referencing, but they had, it was a printed manual you used to buy it, but it had, it was a great thing about it, it had examples of everything. So, and uh, my suggestion to you is just go to the source of truth and go to them, and they'll give it to you. Of course, you're still using the APA format here, exactly the same. So the same referencing. Your end note will work just the same, and you'll do your referencing in that way. So the themes are very important to you because you're going to write about them. So we had visionary leadership over here, which is a good theme, as I mentioned, but it's different to communication. Communication is a good theme. Authentic leadership is a good theme. Personal productivity is a very good theme, or personal impact, if you want, as a leader. These are good themes that you can use. So when it comes to Sakai, it's your program manager. In this case, it's Noni, right? non Chancellor. She's the contact person. I will send out to you your marker's name, and then they will write to you and just, uh, just confirm the deadlines, and then you can ask them questions if oh, you need okay, to. Okay. Okay? So that's the way it works. If the, the markers are not sure, they'll contact me, and I'll then reply to the markers. If I think it's a general issue, I'll post it actually on the announcements. If there's a general issue, I think people need to know. Okay? Good. Happy about the themes now and how the themes work and what you're going to do to drive that. Remember, this has to be an in-depth investigation. It cannot just be superficial, top of the mind, trite writing. You're going to the literature to find answers to these issues. Right. So that is the literature review then and how you'd go about tackling it on leadership. As I said, authentic leadership is a very good theme to look at. 
And you can certainly look at that. Bill George has written a great deal about it. He's written an article about it. He's also got a very good video if you want to watch it. Just type in Bill George on YouTube and you'll see a number of videos that he's got and well worthwhile thinking about authentic leadership. Notice that one of the key things in authentic leadership is self-awareness. He also speaks about your life story and what really matters to you because it should be, I want to become a leader not just to be successful, but to fulfill what I believe is right and proper. And he speaks about that, of course, as well. So now we're going to change from leadership to personal change. And one of your prescribed readings is Primal Leadership, and it speaks about a model of change. So one of the things you're going to be looking at is models of change. Let me just take you through this particular model of change. It's a very straightforward and simple model of change. It's something that you'd warm to because you can understand it. It's the, exactly the same model you do lose, use for losing weight, by the way. Uh, the question is, who do I want to be, right? And in this case, it would be, who do I want to be as a leader? In other words, my ideal self as a leader. Have I thought about that? And then, of course, hopefully, why would I want to be this ideal leader? What would be the benefit for me? If I cannot see the benefit for me, then why should I bother? So it should be that you think through why you want to be an ideal leader in that way. Then, of course, the very important question would be, who am I now? Where am I starting from? If I want to get to that particular point as an ideal leader, where am I actually starting from? Then, as you've got it in your project, is how do I get from here to there, which is your action plan. So you can see what we've done here is we've said, who do I want to be? We're saying, don't just ask yourself that question. Go and look at the literature to see what it says a good leader should be, and then hopefully you incorporate that in terms of the leader you want to be. And then, of course, the next question is, how do I make it stick? Because very often people change for a short period of time, and then they relapse. So you've got to ask yourself, what can I do to maintain the changes that I want? So if management by wandering around is one of my themes, it's no good that it's a one-month wonder, and I wander around and I see everyone. Next month, I just go back to how I was. That's why I say have some measures in place to make sure that you're still doing it. Okay? And then, of course, who can help me? Because very often, when I can get people to work with me, I stand a much better chance of maintaining my change. Okay? So that's just a simple model. Let's have a look at some of the questions that are asked. So... The way it's described in your prescribed reading is you ask the question, who do I want to be? And you write a description of yourself in a few years' time. What would you be doing at work? What network and knowledge base would you be using? How would you feel about yourself when you've reached that happy state? Who would you be working with? Right? And what values would it actually speak to in terms of you and your dreams? So that would be saying, this is my ideal self, and you'd be asking those questions. Next question would be this. Where am I starting from? And I'd do a reflection on who I am. So feedback and reflection. I'd listen with both my eyes and ears. I could keep a journal to make sure to understand where I'm starting from, who am I now. That'd be also, of course, self-awareness. And then the next stage would be plan, do, and review. You could rate your days, and you should become a personal scientist so you know what leads to a good day and what leads to a bad day. This here is a literature review still, which is describing what you should do to change. So they have a number of models of personal change, of which, so there are many, yeah, yeah. and you then choose the one that you want. But here, you'd be discussing them as models of change. Mm -hmm. Here, by the way, you'll find a lot of peer-reviewed articles, because it's a very popular area. Because you think about drug rehabilitation, it's all about this. So there's a lot of clinical work that's done on personal change, which you can pick up. But equally, there are people like Boyatzis who write about it in terms of ordinary people making changes, not people with huge problems. Okay, so that is what one must do there. Then, how do I get from here to there? Now, this is uh, quite interesting. If you read the article, the one person said this. He said, it actually was a woman, she said, I've attended the workshops, I've read the books, and nothing has helped. It hasn't changed me. Sure. Think about that. If I look around this room, 30% of you read parts of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. 
and you're still wondering what didn't happen, that should have happened. Is that right? It reads well, it makes sense, and I want to do it. Not so. But I don't get around to doing it. That's the problem. Is that one has a good intention, but the question is how do I change from the good intention to doing it day by day? So, this person speaking about it, and I think I've given you this example before, but I'll repeat it. He said, what I'm going to do, so it was a female who said nothing changed. Then there was another person by the name of Jean, and he said, I want to become more empathic. Part of my change and become a better manager and leader, I want to be more empathic. And he said, for me to become more empathic, I'm not going to reread Covey. What I'm going to do is I'm going to work in a crisis center and I'm going to coach my daughter's soccer team. Okay? Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is this. Why did he choose to do that instead of rereading Covey? So he says, no, 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 no. I'm going to now go and work in a crisis centre. I'm going to go and coach my daughter's soccer team because I want to become more empathic. So why does he do that? Quick as a flash. You know, I really want to become more empathic. My wife tells me I'm not empathic. My people at work say I'm not empathic. And I realise that I should be more empathic. I'm very impatient. I don't listen to people. I just bulldoze ahead. Not good. Certainly working in a crisis centre, do you agree? I'm there to try and help people. And if I don't listen, my chances of helping them are virtually nil. That I understand as being fairly intelligent. That I've got to really think about what their problems are. It's not about me telling them not to jump. Right? I've got to listen to their problem. Daughter's soccer team. Do I want my daughter's friends to think I'm a good guy? Yeah, yeah I do. Therefore, I've got to do everything possible to listen to them and understand what they want from me as a coach. So I really try really hard to do the right thing. But it's, it's in the real life situation where I'm at risk. Therefore, I really think about what I'm doing. And in that way, when I've learned those new behaviors and I've practiced those new behaviors, I can generalize them back to the workplace. See what it's doing? Saying I've got to actually do something. So think about that in terms of an action plan. It shouldn't always just be I'm going to do this, 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 and this. It may be that I'm going to go and see if I can work in another department, or go and work here, or work there, and in that way develop the skills. Something creative that you can do. So personal productivity be different. What I've got to do is make the best use of my time. So the gap between your ideal self and your current self, you're going to develop the tactical plan. This is going to be when you do your uh, action plan. At this stage, you're talking about how it happens using a journal to track changes, discussing plans with somebody. It falls under the heading typically of time management and self-management that these things occur. Okay, how do I make change stick? There's something from the literature, big decisions govern little decisions. So you want to make big decisions to steer your personal change. Very important point that we're inclined to leave out, which Jean did build in, is you need practice to bring about change. So therefore, you should practice your new behaviors in that way. New habits, if you want to entrench a new uh, habit, you typically have to do it for 20 days. Do it repeatedly for 20 days, and you develop a new habit. Then there's also the element of mental rehearsal, which is very good. So the example that's given, you're going to go into a meeting, and you know there's going to be a difficult situation, and you react badly to it. You're going to lose your temper. You actually imagine yourself interacting with the people, and you imagine yourself not reacting to triggers that would normally lead you to being uh, very cross. So that would be mental rehearsal to entrench new ways of behaving. And then, of course, the final thing would be asking the question, who could help me? And there are a number of people who can help you with change quite clearly. So you want to con if you want to control yourself, you should put yourself under the control of others. So that's a very interesting example. So here we go. If we had time, I'd ask you for your suggestions. I'll give you the answer once again. Okay. But if you take Alcoholics Anonymous, people who want to control their drinking, or stop drinking, not control their drinking, if they want to stop their drinking, what do they do? They join Alcoholics Anonymous, they go to the meetings every week, and they put themselves under the control of that group of people to control their own behavior. Think about that. As a lesser example would be something like Weight Watchers or Way Less, same story. What do I do? I get weighed in every Tuesday, right? 
and therefore I watch what I eat because I know there's going to be a consequence on Tuesday. I'm putting myself under the control of that group of people. So just to be aware of that. Then a community of support. You could either create that yourself or use your syndicates. Executive coaching. Sometimes I might want to get myself a coach to help me make the changes. Many of you will have personal trainers. Same thing could apply if you want to change your leadership style. Get yourself an executive coach. You could have a mentor. A mentor is different to a coach, but they can also help you. And then friends at the office, or as they you can de develop your own support group to bring about the change. Good. So that will just be a model of change, which here, in the literature review, all you'd be doing is discussing the model of change, not talking about what you yourself are going to do. That comes in your action plan. Just remember, literature review is going to be written in the third person, even though you're talking about personal change. In other words, about things that you would do. This you won't be able to see clearly, but it is in the literature that you've been given. But that's just a more elaborate model of Beatsis and others talking about intentional change. And you can see what they talk about there as a model of change, a very good model of change, a detailed model of change. Literature review, you tell me you know all about it, so I'm not going to spend time on that. So I think if there's anything there that you want to ask a question about, but you should have covered all of that in terms of ARP. Okay, so there shouldn't be anything there that's not new to you. And then a good literature review, I'm not going to talk about that either. Um, just to say quite clearly, the literature review is part of the learning. That's why it's there, so that you can get new insights. This is the video that I showed you at the very beginning, if you want to watch it again. That is the YouTube link for it. It's a good video. And now we come to the personal action plan. Think about the logic. I've gone to the literature and I've found out what a good leader should be. I've written up five themes of what good leadership is in terms of those five themes. At the end of my literature review, I've written a summary in terms of what I learned about leadership, also about personal change. So now I start my personal action plan by writing who do I want to be. In other words, that's a description of the ideal leader I want to be. It's in broad brush terms, so it doesn't speak about what I'm going to do, but it says this is the leader I'd like to be. Only one page, right? Just one page. Then I go on from there, detail action plan well thought through, based on the literature, including literature on personal change. It should be credible, practical, and believable. So when we read these, very often we say to ourselves, this student has thought very deeply about this and they're really going to do something about it. Because they've thought out, I know you're waiting for the other one, which speaks differently, but this is where we see that people really are serious about the changes they want to make. And we can see that quite clearly because they've actually thought it through and they've written down something that's going to work and it's practical, they put measures in place to make sure it happens. What we're not looking for are the trite action plans which no one has any intention of doing anything else about. So just be aware of that. Okay, so weak action plans lack coherence. They're trite and not believable. No one would believe that anyone's going to do anything about that. They should be structured in order of priority. So sometimes one thing has to happen before the other. You should structure it in that way. And of course, I've spoken about this, but you should have mechanisms for measuring and monitoring. Because otherwise, how do you know that you've made the change and equally how are you maintaining that change? So that should be built in very straightforward and simple. We spoke about the example of management by wandering around. You just do a simple measure once a week to see how you're doing. Okay? And then we come to insights from the MBA. Now this should be very, very straightforward and simple for you. Because you've done it, it specifies which courses you need to speak about and you'll be speaking about all your core courses on the MBA. And you'll be giving your insights from that. Three insights from each one. And when you've done the three insights from each one, then you will speak about your key or main insight that you got out of all of them. And that should be fairly straightforward and simple to do, not difficult to write. Right? So your big bang idea at the very end, the one that you would say, if somebody were to ask me at a cocktail party, what is the biggest idea that you walked away with from the MBA, and you give that one idea. Right? 
Okay. And I'll leave you to think about that. But are there any questions? Because this should be fairly straightforward. All happy about what an insight is? Insight would be something that changed your thinking about how things work. And that's why you came to do the MBA. Because you walked in thinking one thing and you walked out thinking another thing. Right? So the example that I give in the actual course pack is this one, that in operations you should have covered the fact that not automatically do you get synergies when you combine departments. Right? That you need to be cautious. It doesn't always happen. So that would be an insight. Because before the MBA, I would have believed that you put departments together, you get economies of scale, you get synergies, and it always works. Do the MBA, I realize it does not work like that so easily. It can, but it may not. And therefore, I need to be very cautious about it. Insights should be very straightforward for you. Um, you, because you started the MBA in January 2018, you just run through all the core courses. Uh, if you've done a PDBA or you've done a PDM, then you get certain exemptions, but it's all detailed there. But for you, you just do all the uh, different courses, okay? And then the last point is your video, your three-minute video. Now, you've done the whole leadership quest, and now all you're going to do is basically speak about your belief of what you should be as a good leader, right? We've set up a scenario so that you can do it as if you were speaking to people that are going to employ you. And you're saying, well, this is the sort of leader I'm going to be. I've put there, just to make it a little bit more concrete, for some people might like that, a financial services company. If you say, no, never ever, I'd never work for a financial services organization. First of all, you get 80% for the assignment without us even reading it. <laughs> but, but besides that, but besides that uh, the point is this. If you say, no, it doesn't make sense for me. I work for a small manufacturing company. At best, I'd be interested in being the CEO of this manufacturing company. You're welcome to write to your marker and say, I'd like to do my video from this frame of reference. Happy about that? I've just set it up so at least you've got something to work with. So they say, oh, yes, okay, okay. If I was the head of a small bank, this is what I would say, or a small insurance company, this is what I'd say. I know that I'm speaking to, I'm going to be leading people at a certain level, so it makes it easier for me to think it through. And that's really why the scenario is set up like that. But quite happy to entertain it if people say, no, it doesn't fit in with what I'd like to do. As a leader, we'll then say, fine, okay, let's agree what you're going to be doing, and you can do it that way. Happy about that? But please remember, every time you choose to deviate from the brief, you must write to your marker or tell your marker, because they don't know. Okay, they don't know. And their injunction is that they must mark according to the brief, and the brief takes precedence over everything. Because you've got the brief, they've got the brief, and that's what we work to. Any deviation should be agreed. Notice that if you look at the mark breakdown for the video, technical quality and creativity is 10%. Very, very low percentage. Because we're saying it's not about making stunning videos. It's about you speaking about leadership. So we do need to be able to hear it. That's the only technical aspect that is very important. <laughs> so <laughs> please just make sure that your sound is good, because we do get videos where you can't hear. And we do get videos that are made in planes. That's not quite what we have in mind. So it should be that you take it seriously, but we don't need to have high-quality videos. Do we get high-quality videos? Yes, indeed, we do. We get stunning videos where people have gone to an awful lot of trouble to do a three-minute video on their leadership uh, manifesto. Just remember that if you want to do the old 200, 2018 one, you must let your marker know, but otherwise do the new one which is simpler and more straightforward. Great, well thanks very much for coming in and I wish you luck with your leadership quests.